mentioned last week that we are and we are continuing in a series in living the new life in Christ. And last week we looked at the living the new life with persevering faith. And after that message, there was a number of comments, uh, all very positive and encouraging. But there was also some questions and some uh, responses that came forward. And I wanted to answer and deal with some of those questions and responses this morning. And so to do that, we're going to look at Mark chapter 4. Then we're going to go back and uh, kind of hop, skip, jump our way through Hebrews a little bit, looking at some passages and some verses. And the issue we're looking at this morning is that of assurance and security. Living the new life in Christ with assurance and security. What I want to do is I want to ask and try and answer four questions. What is true conversion? What assurances does God in the Bible give us? What warnings must we heed? And what exhortations must we obey as true believers in Jesus Christ? Uh, we can turn that, that hymn off, Brady. Just go back one slide. There we go. So in order to grasp and fully our assurance and perseverance in faith, we need to consider just how true conversion works. It really works. Let's read together Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to read verse 1 to, down to verse number 20. And I'm reading from a New American Standard Bible, and it says, He began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things and parables, and was saying to them in his teaching, Listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away." Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables, and he was saying to them, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. So while seeing, they may see and not perceive, and while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road and where the word is sown, and when they hear immediately, Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom, on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary, then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And we trust God will add blessing to the reading of his word. The first question we're going to ask and answer is, what is true conversion? In order to answer that question properly, we have to ask, first of all, why do we even need to be converted or saved? Now, for some of you, this is going to sound like you've heard this a lot before. And that's the case, great, listen again. It's good to be encouraged and reminded. And while you're listening, I encourage you to pray for those who are here in this room, who are hearing this perhaps for the first or maybe only a couple of times before, and they need to be refreshed and encouraged. So pray for each other to hear the words spoken as we listen together. Why do we need to even be converted or saved? We know because of Adam's fall that all mankind are sinners separated from God. Uh, sin and transgression and iniquity and disobedience to God, that's sin. 
And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18 and verse 4 that the soul that sins shall surely die. I'll never forget being a young man at uh, 16th Avenue and even at Sutherland Bible Chapel many, many, many years ago, and Grandpa Biggs came, and he was an old-time gospel preacher. He didn't stand quietly behind the pulpit and just preach. He went back and forth across the, the thing, and he would shout at this section, and then he would shout literally by you and then you. And I remember him saying with a tremendous voice, the soul that sins shall surely die. And he drummed that into us because that's why we need to be saved and converted because the soul that sins shall surely die. The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned and failed to glorify God. The Bible says again in Isaiah 53 and verse 3, all we like sheep have gone astray. In Ephesians 4, verse 18, the Bible says, we're darkened in our understanding and excluded from the life of God because of the hardness of our hearts. And the Bible says, Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verse 1 and verse 5, that we are dead in trespasses, in transgressions and sins. We are spiritually dead and separated from God. That's why we need to be saved and converted. We're in a desperate situation. We stand under the wrath of Almighty God for that sin. But one of the things I picked up this week, and it's very much important to mention this, and Paul Washer was the one who pointed out to me in a book he wrote called Discerning the Plight of Man. We sometimes overstate what that fallen condition really is. So I want to go through and make sure we understand what it means to be fallen, to be in sin, to be dead in sin. While we are spiritually dead outside of Christ, mankind is still created in God's image. The problem is that because of sin, that image is, is distorted and defaced. Mankind still knows something of God. The Bible says in Romans 1, 19 and 20, that what may be known of God is evident within us, for God made it evident to us. But we're indifferent, we're uncaring, we hate and reject, and we disobey God by our sinful actions. Man, in his fallen state, still possesses a conscience. He's able to admire good character and good words and good actions. Mankind in sin is still able to love family and friends and perform acts of selfless generosity and kindness. Sadly, it's always with a goal of glorifying self, not glorifying God. But all mankind is still dead in sins and transgressions and trespasses. The image of God in us has been defaced and distorted in us all. Moral corruption has polluted all of us in every facet of our bodies, our reason, our emotion, and our wills. We are all born with a great inclination towards sin. Isn't it amazing? Who here has little kids? Oh, some of you do, surely. <laughs> well, we've all had little kids at some point, right? Who here taught their kid? Now, this is how you lie. Nobody taught their kid that. Who taught their kid? Now, this is how you steal. This is how you do nasty things to your sister. This is how, you, and so on, right? We didn't teach our kids that, did we? The reality is every child born has a great inclination towards sin. We're all inclined that way. We're capable of, mankind is capable of the greatest evils, the most unspeakable crimes, the most shameful perversions. If you don't believe me, look at what's going on in France at the Olympics with that Lord's Supper display. It's amazing the wrath of God didn't just crush France right there and then. Look at what happens, what's going on in places like Nazi Germany and Russia before or after the, the war. Terrible things. Man is capable of those things. Without an experience of God's grace, none of our works or deeds will be prompted by love for God, obedience to God, or faith in God. None of us loves God as Scripture commands. None of us glorifies God in every thought and word and deed. All of us will choose self before God in our fallen state. That's what it means to be dead in sin. 
Even the acts of supposed selfless devotion, heroic civic duty, or external religious good are prompted by love for self, not love for God. Our minds are hostile toward God. We're unable to submit to the will of God and unable to please God in any sense. We are all inclined to an ever-increasing moral corruption, restrained only by God's intervening grace. And we cannot free ourselves from our sinful, depraved condition. Man trying to free himself from his condition is like being put in the bottom of a well and handed a shovel and told to dig down to get out. No matter how far and long he digs, he'll never get himself out. All it does is make it worse. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 says we're, we're spiritually dead. Psalm 51, verse 5 makes it clear we're morally corrupt. And Jeremiah 13, verse 23 makes it absolutely clear that we are unable to change ourselves. And so you'd think we'd all recognize our situation and come running to God, pleading for his mercy and grace to save us. Surely we could see our situation and go, this is a bad place to be. We need to get out of here and cry out to God who could help us. What does the Bible say? What did Jesus say? John 5, verse 40, he said that we are unwilling to come to him that we may have life. In John 6, and verse 44, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent Jesus draws him. And the word for draw is like scooping up with a bucket. John 6, verse 65, Jesus further said, No one can come to him unless it's granted to him from the Father. Romans 3, verses 10 to 18 contain these phrases. None is righteous, none does good, none fears God, and none seeks for God. If you have the idea in the back of your head that you can come to God on your own without God's work in you, you must take a pair of scissors and cut that verse out of your Bible. Because it's not true. And the Bible clearly states it. We need to be saved and converted or we will suffer the eternal torment of God's unrelenting wrath because our sin offends God. But none of us deserves to be saved and none of us has any desire to be saved if left to ourselves. And then the two of the greatest words in the English language ever put into print, but God. But God. Ephesians 2, verse 4. If you like to highlight your Bible, put a highlight on that. If you don't like to highlight your Bible, put a highlight on that one anyways. Those verses need to be remembered and rec recounted to yourselves over and over again. But God, but God acted when we could not act for ourselves. God, in immense grace and mercy and love and kindness and compassion, he sent his son to live, to suffer, to die, to rise and ascend to heaven. He purchased salvation from his wrath against us. His suffering and death paid our penalty for our sin. His resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, was for our justification. By rising from the dead, he proved who he truly claimed to be. It was true that he really was the Son of God, that he really had no sin. And because he had no sin, his righteousness could be imputed to us. That's why he had to rise again from the dead. His resurrection was for our justification. He ever lives to intercede and plead and pray for us. This morning as we sit here in this service, he's praying for us. What a great thought. Not just a thought, but a truth. He's praying for us that we might hear the word and understand it and believe it. The work of conversion begins with God's work to save us, and then it continues as that gospel message is proclaimed to those who will listen. And we have given in front of us in Mark chapter 4, four types of soil. First, there is the hard roadside soil. God's word, the gospel is preached. The word is heard, but immediately rejected. Satan immediately comes along and swoops up the seed and flies away. There's no conversion whatsoever there. Secondly, we have the rocky soil in Mark 1, sorry, Mark 4, verses 5 to 6. God's word, the gospel is preached. The word is heard and received with an intellectual and perhaps emotional response. There's a great deal of joy as the word, as the, the plant springs up. But the problem is the word is not combined with faith. You say, how do you know that? 
Because the Bible says in Hebrews 4 verse 2, For indeed we have had good news preached to us just as they also But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. How many have sat under gospel messages and heard the preaching of the word of God and not mix what they heard with faith and so experienced no salvation, no change? Brothers and sisters, my friends sitting here this morning, my fear is for some of us sitting here. We've heard the message. We've heard the message. We've heard the message. But unless it's combined with faith, it yields nothing other than to add to our condemnation. No care is taken by these against an evil, unbelieving heart. The writer to Hebrews says in 3 verse 12, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. No self-examination has been exercised to be sure they're in the faith. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, he says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. How do we know there was no faith and no examination? When affliction and persecution and trouble arise because of the gospel, there's no root no root of regeneration and faith and repentance. And so the false convert does not hold fast to God, but falls away. He was not truly saved. Thirdly, there's the thorny soil in Mark 4, verse 7. And Jesus explains it in verses 18 and 19. God's word is preached again, and word is not combined with faith. No care is taken against an evil, unbelieving heart. No self-examination exercised to be sure they're in faith. You say, how do we know? Because the choking of the cares of the world and the worries and all the rest of it rise up around that word and choke it out. And what you see in that soil is a false convert, not truly saved, who does not hold fast but falls away. There's no true conversion. Then finally we have, fourthly, the good soil, the true conversion in Mark 4, verse 8 and verse 20. This is indeed a true conversion, and I want to unpack it a bit in detail to see how it actually happens. It's key to understanding the part beyond that, which is our assurance and how we will persevere. God's word, the gospel, is preached. God in grace regenerates and makes the true convert alive. The Bible says in James 1.18, in the exercise of God's will, his will, He brought us forth by the word of truth. As the word is preached, God makes alive. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, Jesus, sorry, John writes, not Jesus, John writes, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's God's work to regenerate us. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, but God, those two words again, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in transgressions, made us alive. Together with Christ, by God's grace, we're saved. That's a great truth. I hope and pray the gospel never becomes boring to you. It never becomes something, oh, yeah, I've heard it before. Here he goes again up there hammering on the pulpit, preaching away. Oh, let's go home. Lunch is ready. Don't ever, 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 ever lose your grasp of the glory of the wonder of the gospel. It's God's grace. God's tremendous grace. God's regenerating work happens before we believe. I know this is a bit of a controversial one for some of you, but I want to show you where the Bible does actually say that. In 1 John 5, verse 1, if you take those words and look at the verbs very carefully, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, literally it should be, has been fathered by God. If you have an NET translation, you'll see it in there. Uh, Has been fathered by God. The, The verb is a perfect passive verb. You say, so what? Well, it's not a grammar class. What does that mean? A perfect passive verb means it's a past tense, completed action performed on us by a third party, God, with permanent, lasting results. 
We have been born again, and the result is that we believe the gospel. We're made alive. We're born again so that we might understand the gospel and believe what it says. God's regenerating work in us makes us willing and able to hear, to come, and to believe. Faith then comes from God through the hearing of the gospel preached. I was thinking about this all through the week. You know, we, we always say, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? That's true, isn't it? I always thought faith comes, it sort of rises up inside as I hear the gospel. No, 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 no. Faith is a gift of God. As we hear the gospel preached, God imparts and gives faith to us. Yes, we absolutely must exercise it, but it's a faith is a gift of God. The word is heard, the message we're hearing it, and it's combined with the faith that we've received. And the true convert believes the gospel. He exercises that faith. In John 3, 14 to 18, John writes and says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him, sorry, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. The spirit of God seals and fills and indwells us as in Christ. Uh, I love the analogy of a wedding ring. I wear this not because it's a nice piece of jewelry. It's a $15 piece of uh, stainless steel. It tells everybody, I belong to somebody. The Spirit of God in us tells all those around us that we belong to somebody else. We belong to Christ. The Spirit of God seals and feels and indwells us. In Ephesians 1.13, the Bible says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Stamped, marked, branded is the idea of that sealing process. The Spirit of God brings conviction of sin. In John 16 and verse 8, that's one of his roles. God gives the believer the gift of repentance. I had no idea that Chris was going to mention that in his prayer this morning, and my heart just leapt for joy when he mentioned that. The gift of repentance. Acts 5, verse 31, the Bible says that God exalted Christ to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant, to give repentance to Israel. A little later in Acts 11, verse 18, the Jerusalem church recognized that God had also granted repentance that leads to life to the Gentiles. You repented of sin? That's God's gift. You want to know what repentance is in detail? I did two messages on it uh, earlier last month. Go back and have a listen. God gives us then the assurance of our conversion through the Holy Spirit. And the true convert experiences great peace and joy within because they are forgiven of sin. They're reconciled to God. They no longer face eternal death penalty. They have and enjoy life in Christ. They recognize the work of the Spirit of God within them. They see the evidence in changing inclinations and responses to God and to others. I can still remember um, 11, what was I, 13 years of age. And discovering after a couple months, man, there's something weirdly different about me. I mean, I used to beat up on my sister. Now I'm nice to her. Something is wrong. Well, that's not wrong. It was something very much right. I changed. Other people could see it. One of the marks of a Christian, one of the ways we know that we are truly saved is we see the work of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, producing change. Reactions have changed, responses have changed, inclinations have changed. We have a hatred of sin and a love for God. The true convert 
enters the rest of God through belief in Christ. And the true convert takes care against an evil, unbelieving heart. They examine themselves to look and see the evidence of faith, evidence of the Spirit of God at work within. And the true convert works out their salvation, Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, in fear and trembling. Now that's a lot. Let me just collapse it down into a series of statements. How does true conversion happen? We have all sinned and gone our own way. But God promised salvation through Christ. God sent the Son to save us. God purchased our salvation. God sends preachers with the gospel. God regenerates the true believer. God gives faith to believe. God fills us with his spirit. God grants us repentance. We believe the message and we repent of sin and we're saved. God holds the believer fast and secure. God began his work of salvation and God will finish that work. The only thing that we contribute to our salvation is the sin and rebellion that made it necessary. That's all we contribute. You say we have absolutely no choice and no say. No, I didn't say that. Does God pursue us? Yes. I've seen men under conviction of sin sitting through church services, tears streaming down their faces. They heard the message. They got it. They knew it. I'm convinced that God had regenerated them already. They were made alive, but they were wrestling with what they heard. God was at work. Salvation is of the Lord our God. The scriptures say that. Even faith and repentance are God's gift to us. How great, beloved, is the Lord our God who saves us. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised for his great salvation. What assurances do we have? How do we know that what God has started is truly going to be finished? Well, first of all, we have the fact that it's God's unfailing work of salvation. That's our assurance. He did the work. Look at creation. Pick up a leaf on your way home and look at the intricacy of a common leaf laying on the ground. And you see the incredible handiwork of God in that created little leaf, a a nothing. And then you realize the work of creation is God's work just as surely as that little leaf is God's work. And you see the perfection of all that's in there and you realize God will finish what he began. Our salvation in his hands is absolutely sure and secure. But just to give you some extra helps, in Jude 24, the Bible said that God is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. Your assurance is in God. In John 6, verses 39 to 40, Jesus said, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. You want to know how for sure you're going to last? How you're going to survive all the way to the end? Jesus said, He's given to me, and I will lose nothing. Jesus never loses his believers. His sheep are secure and safe under his care and his leading. In John 10, 27, 29, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And then he goes on to say, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of his hand. You think you can pry yourself out of God's hand? Good luck. It won't happen. The big issue that we're dealing with here is not those who are truly saved and can lose their salvation. The issue is, are we truly saved to begin with? That's where the writer to Hebrews is going to go. Those are the warnings. We'll get there in a bit. Romans 8, 38 and 39, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing can take our salvation away. In 2 Timothy 1, 12, Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day. I could give you a whole more, more verses, but I won't. They're on the note sheet. You can look them up. 
We have absolute assurance because the work of God in us is absolutely perfect and complete. He made us alive. He gave us the faith. He gave us repentance. He has called us and changed us and made us new creatures in Christ. He began a good work, and he's going to finish it. You have no fear of losing your salvation. You cannot pry yourself from God's hand. But there are warnings that we must heed. There are texts, and this is the question I got, what about some of the texts that seem to say we can lose our salvation? To be clear, I added the word seem, because I don't believe they do say it. The question is, what about the texts that seem to say we can lose our salvation? First of all, we hold every text on every topic in context with all the other texts on the same topic as best you're able. You want to do a study on something? Don't look at one text on that topic. Get a topical study Bible or look on the internet and look up all the verses that speak to that topic and put them all together and understand it comprehensively. Heresies and errors and heretical movements get started because usually because one guy pulls one verse out of context and rereads the scriptures entirely on the basis of one verse, not all of them. Secondly, basic biblical interpretation means you interpret less clear texts in light of more clear texts. There are some texts that are not as clear as others in dealing with particular topics. Never base, thirdly, all your understanding on a key topic on one obscure text while overlooking all the others. Again, that's how errors and heresies get started. In the case of eternal security, once saved, always saved, a couple things to keep in mind. Keep in mind what Jesus said about the four soils and the four hearts. Three of four were false conversions. One of the four was a true conversion. Keep in mind that all that God has done and is doing to save and preserve all those who truly believe. Go back and look at all those verses in points one and two. The short answer to the question about texts that seem to portray believers losing their salvation is one of two possibilities. Number one, they were never true converts to begin with. That's almost certainly the case. Second case, it's also possibly that God, they have believed and they've wandered away, they've backslidden away for a time, but God in his discipline, which uh, the writer of Hebrews will talk about in Hebrews 12, God in his fatherly discipline will bring them back with some gentle spankings to put them back into a right relationship with God. A true believer cannot walk away forever. They will come back. And I would argue that the, the longer that time goes on, the less likely they were a true believer. And I say this with one name in my mind. That doesn't mean anything to anybody here except for my family, the name of Jay. It's the one name in the back of my mind when I say this because my friend, after many years of faithful service to the Lord, walked away. And the question became, and people were saying, well, he'll come back. We know he'll come back because he was truly saved. And after now, whatever it is, 10, 15 years, we begin to wonder. So two possibilities. They were never true converts to begin with or God will discipline them to bring them back and will restore them. Take your Bibles, flip over to Hebrews chapter 3. We're going back to Hebrews again. Hebrews 3, we're going to look at two passages, Hebrews 3 and then Hebrews 6. Hebrews 3, verses 5 to 19. Um, yeah, let's read it together. Hebrews five, 3, verses 5 to 19, the, the writer says, actually, yeah, no, Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. Verse 6, but Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they will always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. 
Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, while it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those that came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Okay, if you read verse 6 slowly, you might pick up what, what the, the question that was raised. Whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm to the end. Does that not somehow seem to suggest, if you think of a very critical mind, as possible to lose your salvation? If you don't hold fast all the way to the end, you're not going to be part of Christ's house. So therefore, you have to hold fast, and it's more dependent on you. That's the, the other argument. I don't subscribe to it, but that's the question. That's the argument behind it. Notice, notice the illustration he gives from the Old Testament. The generation who came out of Egypt. Okay, let's just time out for a sec. Go back to those four soils, right? Four soils, four types of people hearing the same message. And I would argue that in every church, there are at least three of those four. The one where they immediately rejected, unlikely somebody would come into church, hear the message, reject it entirely, and keep coming. More likely that the other three, the rocky soil, the weedy soil, and the true soil, are coming and they're hearing. And I would argue that for some people, the rocky and the weedy soils, they have heard the message, they've responded with an emotional or an intellectual assent, they get it, they agree with it, but there's not true faith there. There's not an actual act of repentance going on in their lives. They have simply, try again, simply subscribed to something that sounds really good and really good. And yeah, really good. We'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Sometimes my enthusiasm gets the better of my mouth and my mouth can't keep up. My argument and my fear is for Noble Park Evangelical Baptist Church that there are weedy and rocky soils sitting here week after week. And the real troubles of Christianity haven't begun yet. And when they do, fly away. And the writer to Hebrews is writing his letter because he sees these believers and they're, they're struggling. They're discouraged. They're downcast because of the difficulties and trials. And he's writing to them to shake them up and warn them lest they be found like one of those soils that went away, did not truly believe had not mixed the word with faith, had not truly repented of sin toward God. Notice the illustration he gives in verses uh, 7 down to about verse 11. They hardened their hearts, and he warns us, don't harden your heart. Three times in the space of two chapters, do not harden your hearts. They tested and tried God in verse 9. They saw the works of God in verse 9, the second part. They always go astray in their hearts. Sound familiar? All we like sheep have done what? Gone astray, right? They have not known my ways. Verse 10, they sinned and did not obey. And in verse 19, they were not able to enter because of unbelief. These are not those who truly believed and then turned away and fell away. These are those who never believed to start with. They were in the congregation of God's people, but they were not true believers. The writer is warning us to take care lest we be found like those same there. Let's go over to Hebrews 6. This one is a difficult text. Hebrews 6. We're going to read verses 4 to 8. Actually, we'll read verses 1 to 8. He says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, 
Let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. For this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation, useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Again, keeping all that we've said about conversion and salvation in context with this text. The text is describing, and I hold this view, and I think most of us would, but I know some don't. The text is describing those who have not truly believed. And it serves as a warning against unbelief and disobedience. Notice all those blessings that are listed there. Enlightened with truth. Tasted of heavenly gifts. Partakers of the Holy Spirit. Tasting the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. But notice... What's strikingly missing his main point through the whole book? What's he keep talking about? Unbelief and disobedience or belief and obedience. What's missing there is his repeated exhortation about belief and obedience. These ones in this passage are like the two soils in Mark 4 who have never truly been converted, especially the rocky soil. They spring up, there's joy, but there's no root. They've heard the word. They've received it with joy and gladness. They've experienced or partaken in the Holy Spirit's work. Pause for a sec. Does the Holy Spirit work in the lives of unbelievers? You all should be doing this. Absolutely, he does. How does he bring conviction of sin and an unbeliever? He works to bring it. What happens before we're saved? The Spirit of God is working in our lives to bring us to a point where we accept and understand we need to be saved. The Spirit of God is working. When he talks about partakers of the Holy Spirit, he's talking about the work of the Spirit of God in those unbelievers' lives. All of those things that are listed there are possible without ever being truly born again and believing the gospel repenting of sin, and obeying its commands. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again this morning. I'm sorry if I walk on toes, sort of. There are many in the church today living like Christians. They've witnessed, they've heard, they've seen, they've tasted, but they've never truly believed, repented, and obeyed. Oh, that doesn't cause you just to step back and gasp. It's a tragedy. But let's, let's just put this text in the context with the others. If you take this passage to be saying that you can genuinely be saved and then genuinely lose or renounce your salvation, you got a massive problem. All those other texts are not true or only partly true, which means, according to biblical inerrancy, get your scissors out because you've got some cutting to do to solve the problem, and it won't solve it. Consider, if it's true that you can genuinely be saved and truly renounce and lose your salvation, you have to consider that God is not able always to keep you from stumbling or make you blameless in his presence. You can beat him. Jesus is not always able to give eternal life to believers. And guess what? You may be able to snatch yourself from both his and the Father's hands. Good luck. God's not always able to guard what we've entrusted to whom. The true believers are not really protected by God's power through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. And the Spirit of God can only testify that you might be saved. No. A thousand times no. Ultimately, if you 
having been truly regenerated, given faith and repentance and filled with the Spirit, if you're believing the message and repenting of sin and obeying God's commands, and then for who knows what possible reason you truly renounce your salvation, you have to accept that you are stronger than God and many verses must be cut out of your Bible. Again, good luck. God who created the universe in six days and took a day of rest, do you think you're stronger enough to say, I can beat what he's promised? No. Okay, let's go back to the text again, Hebrews 6. What about this impossibility of a renewal of repentance? What does that mean? Remembering that Acts 5.31 and Acts 11.18 clearly define that repentance is a gift of God. Repentance is granted to us. Those who have experienced all of what these have without belief and repentance and obedience to God, there comes a time when God says, enough, no more. You say, where is that in the Bible? Romans 1.24, 126, and 128 describe a terrifying reality. It says, God gave them over. In other words, you reject and reject and reject. You remember Pharaoh? He would not submit to God's rule. He rejected and he rejected and he rejected. And finally, God said, enough. And he rejected Pharaoh. And then God said, now I will harden his heart doesn't sound like the nice soft God we like to talk about does it but that's the God of the Bible Romans 1 28 to 31 just listen and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, their gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. That's a frightening passage of Scripture. God gave them over to that. And beloved, my fear is that for some sitting in the church year after year, Sunday after Sunday, listening to sermon after sermon, they've heard and heard and heard and heard and heard the message, but not combined it with faith. God finally says enough. Beware. That's the the force of the whole book of Hebrews Beware, watch out, be warned. Beware lest you be either the rocky soil or the weedy soil. Beware lest you have you are one who has heard but not believed, seen but never submitted, convicted by God's Spirit but never truly converted. That's the force of the writer's argument. In fact, uh, 3 and verse 12 Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. He's talking about falling away from the congregation as a general thing. That verse, one writer said, that that sums up almost the entire book in that one verse. I, I mentioned it several times this morning. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed fail the test? Oh, brother and sister in Christ, listen. Do you bear the fruit of a changed life? Is the Holy Spirit of God at work in you producing evidence of his presence? I should look? Yes, you should. Paul commands it twice. Test yourselves. Examine yourselves. Take a look. Look and see. I'm going to finish up with what exhortations must we heed. Now remember again, 
Okay, this whole book of Hebrews is a sermon written to genuine believers whose faith was being tried and tested. They were discouraged. Their endurance and perseverance was slipping. They're in danger of departing and falling under God's, the Father's, disciplining hand or displaying that they were never true believers to begin with. And so our unknown writer, our author, tries to encourage and exhort them to hold fast to Christ. So I want to spend the last few hours of this sermon considering some of his exhortations because we desperately need them in our time. In Hebrews 3, 6 to 8, he says, Hold fast our confidence and the hope, boast of our hope firm until the end. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me in the day of trial in the wilderness. One of the questions I got asked last week, and the comment was, how can you, in your Calvinistic way of seeing things, why is it you need to hold fast? If you really believe God's going to hold you fast to the end, why bother holding fast? I mean, who's stronger, you or God? God is, praise God. Why do I need to hold fast? Why? Because it displays the reality of my conversion that I hold fast to Christ. I will not let him go. Holding fast displays our love for Christ. It displays our unwavering faith in Christ as we hang on to him. It displays our obedience to God's word that commands us to hold fast. It displays our utter and total dependence on Christ. What gets you through the day, Nelson? Jesus. The moment I open my eyes, the moment I go to sleep, and then beyond my sleep, he holds me fast when I'm asleep. It displays my joy and satisfaction in Christ alone, holding fast to Christ, Christian, knowing that he holds fast to you. Hebrews 3, verses 12 to 13, the Bible says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away, but encourage one another day after day. Why is it we desperately need the church? Because we all struggle. Yes, God is working in us. Yes, he's going to finish the race, but his, it's a long, slow work. And there are days when our faith gets tested and gets weary and we get tired in the journey. And I need John to come alongside of me and put his arm around me and say, come on, man, let's keep going. Let's pray for each other. Let's share a verse together. We encourage one another to keep going, to hold fast to Christ, knowing he's holding fast to us. Verse 12, like I said before, it serves as the book's message in a single verse. It's the same idea that Paul writes about elsewhere. In Philippians 2, verses 12 to 13, he says, So then, my beloved brethren, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. How do we take care? How do we work out our salvation? How do we test and examine ourselves to determine the reality of salvation? We look for evidence of the spirit of God's work within. Look what he says. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Four, explanation. It's God who is at work in you both to will and to work. How do you work it out? Look and see what the spirit of God is doing. We examine ourselves to see our attitude towards sin. We examine ourselves to see our attitude towards God, our love for God and his word, our hatred of sin. The fruit of our lives, is it bearing fruit? Is, are our lives bearing fruit or not? Hebrews 4, verse 16. Just listen. I'm just going to read the verses without comment. Just listen. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hold fast, draw near. I said he wasn't going to comment. Hebrews 6, 1 to 3, leave, leaving the elementary teaching. Sorry, sorry. Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washing and laying on of hands, and so on. And this we will do if God permits. Hebrews 6, verse 11 and 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. 
in 19 to 25 of, of Hebrews 10, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another. Mother Version says, stir one another up to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another. Oh, brother and sister in Christ, God has saved us. God is doing his work in us. God will see us through to the end. Hold fast. He's holding you. You cannot lose your salvation. Beware. Beware lest you be found to be one of those soils who have heard the truth and not mixed it with faith and not repented of sin. For that is the tragedy. We're going we're gonna to sing before we go to the Lord's table. I'm going to sing a song because I want to finish with Hebrews 12, the last passage. Looking unto Jesus. This is a, it's an old hymn written, I think, 1804. Uh, it's called Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. I read the first line. It says, Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis the Christ by many rejected. Yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis the long-expected prophet, David's son, yet David's Lord. By his son, God now has spoken, tis true and faithful word. Ye who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great, here may view its nature rightly, here its guilt may estimate. Mark the sacrifice appointed, see who bears the awful load, tis the word the Lord's anointed, son of man and son of God. Would you stand with me? We'll sing together and then we'll go to the Lord's table.